folks, last Sunday we began a three-part series of sermons on living for Christ in the new year. And each of these sermons comes from the 10th chapter of Luke. And we're actually working backwards. We started toward the end and we're, we're working. We're a little earlier in the chapter today and then next week we'll be a little earlier in the chapter. So if you want to read ahead uh, for next week. But, but last week, we joined our Lord as he was in Martha and Mary and Lazarus' home uh, for a meal. And we saw that, that Martha was busy working and Mary was worshiping. And we saw that if we want to live for Christ in the new year, we want to live a life of worship. But what else does God want from us? What else does Christ deserve to expect from us? In, in Luke chapter 10, we read about a young lawyer who ask Jesus a critical question, and it's a common question to man. It's a question that's still asked today. He wants to know how he can live forever. This lawyer wants to, to know what God expects from him so that he can have eternal life. And Jesus is going to answer this man's question with a story. And as we unpack the story, we discover what God wants from us, how we can live for Christ. So in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now he's trying to test Jesus, right? He's trying to, to, to catch him in a mistake, find fault with him. But Jesus uses this as a teachable moment to let him know and let us know how he wants us to live. He said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. Now does that sound easy? Does that sound simple? Love God, love people. Love God, love your neighbor, and you will live. This lawyer asked the question then, okay, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Love God. Love your neighbor. Okay. What does that mean? See, the lawyer already knows this. He knows he's supposed to love God. He knows he's supposed to love his neighbor. But now he's looking for a condition for his love. And, and so it says in verse 29, wishing to justify himself, he says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? What he wants to know is... Who do I have to love? Who, who do, I, do I have to love Gentiles? Do I have to love Samaritans? Do I have to love tax collectors? Do I have to love these Roman guards? Do I have to love my neighbor down the street who plays their bongo drums too loud, I guess? You know, they don't have radios. Do I have to love my mother-in-law? Who do I have to love? Where can I draw the line? And, and when he's asking that question to justify himself, he's not only asking... Uh, who do I have to love, but who do I not have to love? <coughs> who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers with a story. And in this familiar story, we discover not only who our neighbor is, but what it means for us to be a neighbor. How we can live for Christ today. So as the story opens, we're introduced to the first of four main characters, the cast of characters. The first one is the victim. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, y'all know the story, right? So that's the end of the sermon, if you know the story. No. We, we need to unpack this and see what, what God's going to say to us today. Uh, so this guy's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He falls among robbers. They strip him and beat him, and, he go, and they go away and leave him half dead. We think of this as the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of, uh, of the Good Samaritan of the story. Jesus does not say it's a parable. He doesn't say this is a made-up story. I just came up with the teacher. He says a man was doing it. So it is likely or very possible that this is a true story, something that happened, and maybe the people listening to him even know about it. They heard about it. But it's a teachable moment for us. Jerusalem is up on a hill. Everywhere you go from Jerusalem, you're going down. Anywhere you come to Jerusalem from, you're going up. Jer Jericho is down by the river. It's a long, winding road, well known for thieves. 
Uh, it's an 18 mile journey downhill from Jerusalem to Jericho and, and it's often used by priests and people coming to and from Jerusalem. This guy's traveling probably alone down a dangerous road. He's attacked, he's beaten, he's left, left for dead. Now should he be on that road by himself? No. But there he is. Regardless, he's beaten, bloody and alone. Then we have the, the priest. In verse 31, and by chance, a priest was going down on that road. He was going down on that road, and when he saw it, he passed by on the other side. Now, the priest is supposed to be the servant of God, the holy guy. He's supposed to help poor, wounded people. He's, he sees his fellow uh, Israelite, his fellow Jew there, his brother, and he's supposed to go and help this person. Why didn't he? Well, I used to think, well, maybe it's because he was on the way to Jerusalem. He was going to serve in the temple. And if this guy was dead and he touched him, he'd be unclean. He wouldn't be able to serve God in the temple. But it says he was going down the road, right? So if it says he's going down the road, is he going to Jerusalem or coming away from Jerusalem? He's coming away from Jerusalem. He's already served his time in the temple as a priest in the temple. He's leaving. He's headed back home. Probably been gone for a while. He's in a hurry to get home. Maybe he's got a business he's got to get back to, something going on back home, and he's ready to be there. Now think about this. He's just got finished at church, right? <laughs> he just got finished in the temple, and he's been praising the Lord. He's been leading other people in the worship of God, and it's all about God, and it's all about our relationship as we glorify God. And then he leaves that place, and he, and he goes down the road, and he sees some hurt body who desperately needs help, and what does he do? go to the other side of the road. I don't want to get involved in that situation. Why? I'm busy. I got my own plans. I got things to do and, and I can't be bothered by this sorry guy situation. He shouldn't have been on the road by himself anyway. And, and besides that, it's, it, it, maybe it's a trap. You know, it was a well-known tactic. It still is today, by the way. You got this person who's uh, laid on the side of the road, and, and the thieves are in the bushes off to the side. And if you go to help them, then they're going to jump on you. So, so I mean, and he probably used some thinking like that to justify him not wanting to get involved. Did we ever do that? Look for a reason to justify why we don't want to help. Why do we want to go on the other side of the road? He doesn't want to get his pretty robes stained by this guy's blood. And so he goes to the other side. But that's okay, because we got another cast member coming up. The Levite. The priests were considered the, the most holy men in Israel. They were the most revered people in the nation. But next to them were the Levites, because the priests actually came out of the tribe of Levi. The priests were chosen from among them. And so uh, it, it'd be kind of like the, the, the most high holy dudes, and then the Levites are right underneath them. So, okay, the priest was too busy. He had too much going on. He was too holy to help this poor person, evidently. Well, well the Levites, surely, surely he'll help. Verse 32, likewise a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, what did he do? He passed by on the other side. This holy man who, who may have been serving in the temple as well as the priest, perhaps, he's following along down the same path. Uh, and, and when Jesus hears this part of the story, they're probably a little upset. I mean, the most holy person did nothing to help the broken down person on the side of the road, but the Levite is following the example of the priest. And guys and girls, this is why it is so important if you're in a leadership position that you set the right example. Whether it be at work or in church or in your home, there are people watching you and they're going to follow the lead that you set. And it's one thing for you to tell people the right thing to do, but what they're really doing is watching to see what you do. If that priest had been over there helping, guess what that Levi would have done when he come along? He'd have gone over to help too. It's important. But the most holy men in the country, the priest and the Levi, but they see this hurting guy on the side of the road and they pass by on the other side. Then we see the Samaritan. Verse 33, But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion. 
Now, when we hear the story today, we don't, we don't hear it the same way Jesus' audience did back then. Uh, his Jewish audience hated Samaritans. Uh, they, they hated each other. Samaritans hated the Jewish people. Jewish people hated Samaritans. Uh, way back when the Assyrians conquered uh, the northern tribes of Israel, uh, and they carried them away into exile, the, the handful of people that were left in the, the northern uh, kingdom started intermarrying with the pagans around them. And so their offspring, that's where the Samaritans came from. And, and the Jewish people viewed them as unclean, thieves, murderers, hateful people. We don't want anything to do with them. And the Samaritans looked at the Jewish people with hatred as well. There's a lot of history between them, but we just know um, that, that they did not like each other very much. So the best guys in, in Israel, you know, in, 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 the, in the nation, they see a hurting brother of theirs, a, 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 a kinsman, and they ignore him. But then this hated enemy of the Jewish people, he sees this Jewish man and he has compassion. This wicked, unclean man feels compassion. And, and the Jewish people listening to Jesus probably think this Samaritan is a thief himself. He's probably going over there. He sees the guy from the side or he's probably going over there and steal from him too. Maybe kill him. But that's not what happens. He has compassion. And compassion has a cost. Whenever you see somebody hurting and you get involved, it's going to cost you something. What does it cost the Samaritan man? Well, first thing it costs him is a sense of ease. What do I mean by a sense of ease? What do you think? He, he's walking along the road, living his life, living his best life. All is well. Everything is great. And then he sees this guy on the side of the road dying. The priest of the Levite had passed on by. Maybe they did a little rubbernecking as they went by the scene of the crime, you know, but they kept on going. But when this Samaritan sees him, he can't get it out of his mind. He, he can't stop thinking about it. He can't help but empathize and sympathize and hurt for this guy. And, and the Samaritan doesn't ask what will happen you know, what will happen to him if he gets involved in this situation? He asks, what's going to happen to that guy if I don't get involved? There's a big difference. Jesus says he has compassion. His heart goes out to this guy. And when you have compassion for somebody, it is more than feeling sorry for him. In his 1828 dictionary, Noah Webster began his definition of compassion this way. He said, suffering with another. Painful sympathy. Compassion means you see somebody laid low and suffering and you get down there with them. You care enough to hurt with them and to help them bear the load. Instead of acting like nothing it, 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 it is, is uh, uh, nothing is going wrong in his perfect little world, the Samaritan gets down in the dirt with this guy. Instead of acting like, I have no problems, you have no problems, I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. He says, you're not okay. And because you're not okay, I'm not okay. And I'm going to get down there with you. Folks, we live in a time right now when everybody on social media is posting pictures and stories like everything is perfect in their life. You notice that? And, and, and some of y'all, your Christmas pictures... You got the perfect family. You got the perfect tree. You got the perfect decorations. Your kids are perfect. You're per everything's perfect. And, and when we see each other at church or at the store and we say, How are you doing? What's the answer? Good. Good. Great. Better than I deserve. Whatever it might be. But it's always good. It's always positive. We're doing pretty good. We're doing all right. We're doing all right. It's kind of like. It's kind of like that, the, the, the Monty Python view where the guy's getting his arm chopped off. And it's, like, it's just a flesh wound. Just a flesh wound. He chops his legs off and his arms off and he's like a stuff. He still wants to fight. It's just a flesh wound. That's okay. No, you're not. You're dying. But we act like everything is going perfect in our life. That kind of thing is what we expect to hear. We expect to hear people say, oh, it's going great. Because that means everything is all right and I can just keep on going down the road. I'm going down just like everything is fine. What if you ask, how are you doing? And the answer is, I'm lonely and I'm hurting right now. 
What did he say? How you doing? And they said, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. How do you handle that? What if you look beyond the social media perfection post and see somebody whose marriage is falling apart? What do you do? On the, on, on the one hand, brothers and sisters, we need to be more open with one another. I don't have a crystal ball to tell me when you're struggling. And, and, and you can drop hints all day long. I'm dense. Right? <laughs> and I'm not the only one. Your brothers and sisters, sisters sitting around you this morning, they don't know sometimes when you're falling apart. They don't recognize it all the time. I wish I was better at that. All of us wish we were better at that, don't we? But what we need to be more open with one another. If you're struggling, Share with somebody that you're struggling. Share with somebody that you need help. Don't be ashamed to ask for help. Oh, on the other hand, we do need to open our eyes more. We need to, to care enough about the people around us to look beyond the surface and see what's really going on in people's lives. And when we do see somebody beaten and broken on the side of the road, we've got to have compassion for them. We need to care enough to stop what we're doing and get down there and hurt with them and help them carry them. When you have compassion for the hurt, it's going to cost you a sense of ease, like everything is great in the world. The second thing it will cost is time. In verse 34, it says, He came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on him, and he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now, the priests and the Levi, they didn't have time to help. They went on their way. But, and one of the most likely reasons they didn't, and they didn't have time to stop. They had plans, but the Samaritan, he does stop. He puts his plans, his travel plans, his itinerary on hold to help a stranger. Are we busy people? We can fill our schedule up to the brim. And there aren't enough hours in the week for all the working and playing and practicing and meals and church and everything you want to be involved in. There's not enough time. When that person you went to school with Stops you in the aisle at food line and shares with you that, that their family has fallen apart and you see pain in their eyes. What do you do? What do you do? Do you have enough compassion to sacrifice some time to hurt them, to hug them, to pray with them, to, to meet up with them at some point and just encourage them? When, when you see a, a brother or sister whose marriage uh, you know, they have the same marriage issues that almost killed you. Are you willing to sacrifice some of your time to minister to them and to hurt with them and help them walk through? Compassion has a cost. It'll cost a sense of ease. It'll also cost you time. You're going to have to invest time in people. And, and it also costs effort. The Samaritan didn't just kneel down and pray over the guy and spend a little bit of time there. He didn't just hurt with him. He put in the hard work of taking care of him. He cleaned his wound with oil and wine and wrapped his wounds and bandages and he probably cut from his own clothes. He hoists the Samaritan onto his animal. If it's a small donkey, then that means the Samaritan's walking to the end that they go find. And after he gets to the nearest end, he continues to take care of him there through that night. And he feeds the poor guy and probably changed his bandages, cleaned his wounds again. When you have compassion for somebody who's hurting, it costs effort. It can be messy to help. Because people can be messy. The Good Samaritan, did he know what it was going to cost him when he went down there on the side of the road? No, but he went. He didn't know how bad the wounds were. He didn't know if he'd be able to save this guy. But he went and he helped. Because he had compassion. And when you see somebody hurting and you have compassion, that is not the time to stop and do mental calculations. You don't need to try to figure out whether you're going to be able to do everything that this person needs help with and you'll be able to fix all their problems. Because when we do that, if I see this person struggling right here and I feel overwhelmed and I don't, I, I can't fix that, then what am I likely to do? Pass by on the other side of the road. I don't need to make all those calculations and if I can't, I just need to do what I can do. What has the Lord gifted me to do? What is he, what is he calling me to do? What has he equipped me to do for 
as first. And it might just be a hug. It might be to give them a phone number for a capsule. It might be to put them in touch with somebody who's dealing with what they've dealt with. You don't know, but you, you do what you can do. It might be just to listen to them and cry with them. But when you put in the effort in, your compassion tells a hurting person that they matter. That they matter. That they are loved. And that gives them hope. And, and it might mean that you push your arm around them and you listen to their story. It might mean that you, you know, that person who's hurting right now, you cut the grass for them. Or you change a tire for them. Or you get the oil changed in their car for them. There's no telling them what you could do. What effort you could put in. To have compassion for that person who's hurting and in need. But compassion has a cost. A sense of ease, time, effort. And it costs resources. It costs money. Just like the Samaritan didn't know how much effort it would cost to help, he didn't know how much money it was going to cost either. In verse 34, it says, He came and bandaged his wounds, poured oil and wine on him, he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. His compassion cost him oil and wine and bandages and room money, money for a meal at the end and a room at the end. And, and evidently, he's a regular. This, this innkeeper knows him and trusts him. He says, hey, when I come back through, if there's anything else that it costs to take care of this guy, I'll cover that too. A denarii is a day's wage in that day. So two denarii, he drops off two denarii. Basically, it's like today, it would be like taking $250 out of your pocket and saying, hey, look, Used it to take care of this guy, and if there's anything else, when I come back, I'll pay it, whatever it is. Margaret Thatcher once said, No one would have remembered the Good Samaritan if he'd only had good intentions. He had money as well. When you have compassion for hurt people, it often costs you resources, money. You go to buy groceries for that elderly neighbor. You, you uh, pay for the car repairs for that single mother. You, you, you buy school supplies for that poor family. You make sure they have something under their Christmas tree when they can't afford to have anything for that little girl. Maybe you've got an older car that you don't really need. And it might be a huge blessing to that man who can't get to work and needs transportation. And in your compassion, that might be what it costs you. Or maybe it's it's uh, parents who can't afford to get their kid a vehicle, and you can supply them. Maybe you got a piece of property that would really be a blessing to that family that's starting out. They can't afford property. They can't afford a house. They can't afford land. What it boils down to is the reality that, that when you have compassion for those who are hurting and in need, it's going to cost you. It always will. You'll have to make sacrifices of time and energy and money to help other people. The story of the Good Samaritan is one of the best known stories in the world. Somebody said the story reveals three basic attitudes toward human need and suffering. The first one is the attitude of the robbers. What's yours is mine and I will get it. The, the second attitude is that of the priest and Levite. What's mine is mine and I will keep it. The third attitude is the one of the Samaritan. What's mine belongs to God, and I'm going to share it. And that should be our attitude, shouldn't it? Jesus tells this story to answer a question and make a point. The lawyer tests him. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know the answer, you know the answer. Love God, love your neighbor. Jesus says, yes. Looking for a loophole, the lawyer says, who's my neighbor? And Jesus tells this story. And, and then he turns that question around. Who's my neighbor? He turns it around by asking a question at the end in verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And, and he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Folks, 
you don't need to worry about who your neighbor is. You need to be a neighbor. Whose neighbor are you? Who is my neighbor becomes who will I be a neighbor to? Who should you be a neighbor to? There's somebody you're thinking of that you need to be a neighbor to. If a Samaritan can be a neighbor to a man who is despi who despises him, an enemy, then who should we be a neighbor to? And the answer is uncomfortable. Because the answer is messy people. People who are hurt. People who are in need. And this is what Jesus is looking for from me and it's how we live for Christ today. It's by living a life of service. That, that's what the Samaritan does. He, he sees this broken and dying man and, and, and he goes and he helps this broken and dying person. And Jesus says, hey, you go and do the same thing. You want to know how to inherit eternal life? Love God. Love people. Be compassionate toward those who are hurting. Even if it costs you a sense of ease, time, effort, money, resources, even though it's une uneasy, it's uncomfortable, you serve God by serving those in need. But don't misunderstand. You cannot earn eternal life by serving people. It doesn't work that way. You don't earn eternal life in any way. You receive love God. You know what it means to love God? you got to love Jesus. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus, who sacrificed himself on the cross so that we could be forgiven and we could be saved. Our sins could be washed away. And so that's the love God part. Receive Christ as your Savior and your Lord, the one who came and died for you. Receive Christ. That is how you love God. But the other side of that is loving your neighbor. And actually, you know, once you come to Christ, you know how you show love to your God? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. We're supposed to be soul winners for Jesus, aren't we? We're supposed to be telling people about the Lord, but folks don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes of better people and more willing than the ear find counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. The best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds, for to see good put in action is what everybody needs. <coughs> Tomorrow, God may be calling you to stop by the office and talk to a guy whose wife just walked out of him. And maybe your act of service and compassion will be to share your experience with that guy because you've been down that dark road. How can you serve a couple barely making ends meet? Maybe God is going to open your eyes to those people who are hurting and, and share uh, and, 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 and stir in you a way that you can minister to. What if your heart is in it, though? What if you see a person who's hurting, God opens your eyes to see that person who's hurting, and you just don't feel like helping them. Your, your heart's not in it. You don't really feel compassion. Well, you got to lead your heart. you got to lead your heart. That, that is one of my favorite lines. From that movie. You remember that movie Fireproof that came out several years ago? That movie Fireproof. One of my favorite lines, he said, you don't follow your heart, you lead it. That's the truth. Just a few pages over in Luke chapter 12, verse 34, Jesus says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where you invest your time and your talent and your treasures and your testimony, where you invest in serving and helping, guess where your heart goes? To those people. Lead your heart. And if you'll stop walking by people around you who are hurting, You'll start helping them. Serve Your heart will get there. Your heart will get there. And in Matthew 25, Jesus tells his followers that at the time
time of judgment, there will be some who have, are turned away from heaven because they failed to show compassion and mercy to the least among us. When we fail to act in love toward even the least, then we have failed to love Jesus. And, but when we work in love for the least, when we have compassion and we help others, then we have loved Jesus. Because he says in Matthew 25, 35, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And they're going to say, when did we do that stuff? And he says, when you did it to the least of these, you've done it to me. These are works of service done to the master when done to the and as we seek to live for Christ this year, let's live a life of worship. Let's live a life of service. He's calling us not to just feel sorry for hurting people, but to show compassion for them through acts of service. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love, your compassion for us. You saw us and you knew that we were dying in our sins and there was no way for us to save ourselves. There was no way for us to be rescued and you came to save us. You walked with us. You hurt with us. You cried with us. And you died for us. We rejoice to know that and to know that you rose from the dead. You conquered death for us. And you will take us to be with you forever. Lord, it's our prayer right now that you would help us as we go through this week and the coming weeks. Help our eyes be open to those around us who are hurting, those who are in need, the broken. Lord, help us to see them, not to be too busy. And Lord, we ask you to stir our hearts when we see someone in need. Help us to have that compassion and know how to help. Give us discernment there. Give us wisdom there. And help us to help because we love. Because we love you and we love our neighbor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand right now and sing.